As of June 2023, Russian tank losses have exceeded a whopping 4,000 since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. That is a lot of tanks, and Putin's troubles don't end there. Russia will have a manpower shortage very, very soon unless Putin orders another wave of mobilization. But Ukrainian losses have not been insignificant either. So far, Ukraine has managed to constantly mobilize their soldiers and replace their losses. But how long before they start running out of manpower too? Will Putin run out of troops before Ukraine does? Let's hear what our military experts have to say. In February 2023, word got out that a treasure trove of classified US documents had been leaked across the popular social media platform Discord. In those documents were some harsh assessments of the future of Ukraine's counteroffensive against Russia, who had begun their full-fledged invasion a year earlier in February 2022. The more than 100 documents included secret and top-secret files on foreign intelligence, analysis of opponent forces, and briefing documents for US military and government officials. One file in particular stood out. In its pages, the source claimed that Ukraine would be faced with significant force generation and sustainment shortfalls, and the probability that any Ukrainian offensive in 2023 would result in only modest territorial gains if not supported by a sufficient number of troops and hardware. This report was not the first time Ukraine was challenged on whether they had enough men to defeat the vastly larger country of Russia. It's been evident for some time that both Ukraine and Russia have seen a decline in their populations. For Ukraine, the 2014 invasion of the Donbass region and Crimea initiated their population decline. Their population loss has significantly increased since the February 2022 invasion, coupled with the indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas and brutalization of any population that didn't evacuate. Russia, despite having a vastly bigger population, has a vastly different problem. It's huge, aka hugely embarrassing losses of hardware. Russia's hardware problems in comparison to its troop losses are perhaps a more reliable indicator of just how bad the war has been going for them, since tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, trucks and artillery are big and bulky. Their losses are harder to hide and can be counted and identified more easily than individual soldiers. When analysts look at hardware losses Russia has suffered, the numbers are simply staggering. An analysis done by the Ukrainian general staff reports that Russian armed forces have lost over 3,900 tanks, 7,600 armored fighting vehicles, 6,400 unarmored vehicles and fuel tanks, 3,700 artillery systems, 600 multiple rocket launch systems MLRS, 350 air defense systems, more than 300 planes, 300 helicopters, 3,200 drones, and 18 ships. To put this all into perspective, Russia was believed to have only around 3,500 main battle tanks before the invasion. The best estimates were that they invaded Ukraine with a total ground force of around 150,000 soldiers. An update on June 21, 2023 from the same Ukrainian source suggested that the number of lost Russian tanks has just exceeded 4,000. While the estimate from Ukraine might be biased, those from neutral open-source group Oryx are not. They count only those weapon systems for which they can prove beyond a shadow of doubt that they were destroyed or captured and document each and every loss in their figures. They report as of June 13, 2023, Russia has lost, at a minimum, 2,070 tanks, 894 armored fighting vehicles, 2,454 infantry fighting vehicles, 318 armored personnel carriers, and thousands more mine-resistant vehicles, transports, mobile artillery, air defense systems, and various intelligence, supply, and command vehicles. Since Oryx only includes confirmed losses, even they admit Russia's real losses are much higher. There are several indications of how bad Russian material losses are. One of the most glaring is that Russia has been transporting 70- and 80-year-old tanks from storage yards and even museums and sending them by rail to the front. One such relic was a T-5455 that was packed with around 6 tons of explosives and sent trundling to the Ukrainian front lines, though it was blown up before it could reach them. That tank was built a few years after the end of World War II. Others just like it have been photographed heading towards the front lines from all over Russia. Another surprising display occurred during the 2023 May Day Parade through Red Square in Moscow. Normally, this was the yearly event when the supposedly mighty Russian military would parade its newest and most powerful military vehicles, from tanks, IFVs, and multiple launch rocket systems to portable ballistic missiles, all of them overflown by frontline fighters and strategic bombers. But this year, the world received a surprise. 
when only a single World War II-era T-34 tank trundled through the parade. President Vladimir Putin was mocked around the world for such a weak display of supposed Russian military might. So it's pretty clear at this point that Russia is indeed running out of tanks, but does it have enough troops to defend its own cities? Even more embarrassing for Putin was the abortive March for Justice that his one-time chef and military oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin launched for a brief 24-hour period from June 23rd through 24th. Prigozhin's private military company, the Wagner Group, was able to capture the major city of Rostov-on-Don without firing a shot and weren't met with any substantial ground opposition until they were within 125 miles of Moscow itself. The only thing that apparently stopped Prigozhin and Wagner was the failure of a popular uprising to join him. He certainly wasn't stopped by any military units. Most analysts believe that's because the vast majority of Russian military strength is all in Ukraine. Additional shortages of men and material have been seen in the Russian oblast of Belgorod, where a series of cross-border raids launched by free Russian opposition units, together with a small number of Polish expatriates fighting for Ukraine, have caused havoc for weeks. The minimal border security forces there have been wholly incapable of stopping them, not until they were supported by heavy artillery and air force strikes. Some reports say that the Russian defense units didn't even have weapons or ammo, since according to Russian law, it was illegal for them to carry firearms. What about the regular troops? Now that we've seen that Russia has suffered a probably massive loss in hardware and material, and doesn't even have enough troops to protect its own borders, we can better understand the level of their actual troop losses and possible remaining strength. According to the same Ukrainian general staff report mentioned earlier, Russia has lost a staggering 213,000 killed, wounded and missing soldiers, sailors and airmen. That analysis includes more than 43,000 killed in action and over 170,000 wounded, many of whom will not be returning to combat. The Independent Center for Strategic and International Studies CSIS, has come up with an even higher estimate. Their report from February 2023 indicated that Russia had lost as many as 250,000 total casualties. In comparison, this total from just the 12 months of fighting is more than all the combat losses Russia and the former Soviet Union had suffered in all their wars since World War II combined. The estimate of 250,000 casualties would have increased by an additional 60 to 70,000 casualties between February and June of 2023. In just the first three months of the invasion, Russia suffered as many casualties as it did during its entire 10-year war in Afghanistan. What's worse is that according to the most recent reports, their casualty rate may be increasing. Russia lost over 1,100 troops in a single day on June 8th, as Ukraine has begun to hammer Russian forces with its summer offensive. But what's causing such high casualty rates? One of the biggest causes of such casualties is the outdated method in which Russia is conducting the war. Overall, the Russian military doctrine has changed little since World War I. They rely on masses of inaccurate artillery supported by fighters that perform ground attack roles and masses of human assaults, sometimes, but not always, backed up by tanks. But the Russian Air Force, known as the SVS, has seen high losses as well, due to the large numbers of surface-to-air missiles sent by the US and NATO members. They've been reluctant to fly over Ukrainian territory and prefer to lob bombs from the safety of Russian-occupied territory. Russian doctrine also suggests that if the first human assault fails, keep sending in more troops until the defenders fold. Britain's Defense Intelligence Agency points out that such outdated tactics carry with them enormous losses. Their report states that a combination of poor, low-level tactics, limited air cover, a lack of flexibility and a command approach which is prepared to reinforce failure and repeat mistakes has led to Russia's high casualty rate among its troops in Ukraine. But here's the really bad part. These casualties primarily include the vets and the elite. Indeed, one of the most significant areas where Russia's casualties have had a telling effect has been in their elite units. An example of the losses such elite units have suffered can be seen in the current state of the 331st Guards Airborne Regiment, a part of the 98th Guards Airborne Division, one of the best trained and most experienced combat units Russia has available. Prior to the invasion, the 331st Regiment's size was around 1,500 to 1,700 soldiers. It sent two battalion groups into Ukraine at the start of the invasion on February 24, 2022, for a total of 1,000 to 1,200 men. They suffered heavily in the initial day's effort to capture Hostomel Airport, just outside of Kyiv. The lightly armored infantry vehicles that they were sent in with proved no match for Ukrainian anti-tank weapons and heavy artillery. An estimated 94 soldiers almost 10% of their strength, 
were killed in just the first few days of fighting. By the end of the year, some accounts indicated their casualties numbered more than 500. Continued fighting showed that the unit was unprepared for the length of the war. Within just a few weeks of the invasion, locals back at the city of Kostroma, where the unit was based, were holding fundraising drives to send the troops warm clothes. The governor of the region, Sergei Sitnikov, a former CO of the 331st, commented a few months later that we need to help our guys so they have decent conditions. When he visited the wounded survivors, he bought with him care packages from relatives back home and civilian drones bought on the open market. If the conditions were this bad for one of Russia's most elite units, then it can only be much worse for the regular army troops. These same high casualty rates have been reported for all branches of Russia's armed forces, but since the best trained, most elite units are the ones that can be most trusted in a fight, those are the ones that can see the most intense combat, often spearheading assaults in battles around Mariupol, Bakhmut, and as we've seen with the 331st, the initial drives on Kyiv. The problem is, as Russia loses a significant portion of their combat veterans, they're being replaced with less well-trained and less skilled replacements. For a while, the Russian regular troops were supplemented by Prigazin's Wagner forces, widely regarded as some of the most experienced urban fighters Russia had left. But Prigazin's abortive march on Moscow resulted in him being exiled to Belarus, and his Wagner troops being split up between joining him in Belarus, signing contracts with the Ministry of Defense, or returning home to Russia. The Wagner forces had been responsible for the only sector where Russia had made any kind of incremental gains since the opening months of the invasion, that being around the area of the eastern city of Bakhmut. According to the US National Security Council spokesman John Kirby, who spoke to reporters on May 1, 2023, Russia had lost nearly 100,000 casualties in its 10-month siege of Bakhmut, including about 20,000 soldiers killed in combat and 80,000 wounded. Ukraine have lost about one-fifth as many in its defense of the city, according to US intelligence estimates, or around 4,000 killed and up to 15,000 wounded. It was clear that within the first few months of the invasion that Russia had failed to allocate enough forces for the complete subjugation of Ukraine and had vastly underestimated the number of casualties they would suffer. In September 2022, Putin announced a mobilization of 120,000 new troops, while a law was also passed making it a crime for anyone in Russia to call the invasion a war. Those 120,000 weren't enough, however, and further conscriptions raised the total to around 300,000 by the end of 2022. These nationwide call-ups have had a serious negative side effect. On top of losing a quarter of a million men as casualties of war, as many as one million additional young men and women have fled Russia to avoid the conscription. Many of those who left are the young professionals that Russia desperately needs and cannot replace. These emigres have left for various reasons, but their primary reason was to escape the mobilization, along with fleeing the Western sanctions that have caused enormous economic distress within the nation. This has led to a significant manpower shortage across Russia. In an intelligence update released on May 27, 2023, the British Defense Ministry observed that a survey conducted by the Russian Central Bank involving 14,000 employees had determined that Russia's national labor force was at its lowest recorded level since 1998. In addition to losses from the war and emigration to avoid the draft, the survey also showed that the Russian population had previously decreased by up to 2 million in the years between 2020 and 2022, due to several factors, including the poor Russian response to the COVID pandemic, poor healthcare and diet, excessive alcoholism, and an increasingly aging population. Nowhere has this lack of workers been more acutely felt than in the tech sector, where shortages of trained workers have hit the electronics and programming sectors hard. This brain drain, along with continuing Western sanctions, has caused what Laura Solanko, a senior advisor for the Bank of Finland, described as reverse industrialization. This means Russia has not only seen a shrinking of its economy, but has had to replace overseas investment, lost due to Western sanctions, with funds supplied by the state. Solanko reported such policies can only succeed with huge investments in domestic production to replace lost imports, as well as the construction of new transportation links to the east and south. As resources are limited, she continued, this implies less investment in other sectors, including potentially more productive areas. Russia's investments will continue to move away from the technological frontier, she said, which is why she considers Russia's current state of the economy as reverse industrialization. These factors combine to indicate that Russia will have increasingly fewer young men and women for Putin to draft in 2023, if he feels the need to repeat his previous mistake. 
On top of Russia's potentially catastrophic combat losses and manpower shortages, Russia is also facing another area of concern – the loss of their combat leadership. One of the most widely reported problems regarding the Russian army is a distinct lack of unity of command. Part of that problem is currently due to the combat losses which extend up the chain of command. As of November 2022, Russia had lost more than 1,500 officers in the first nine months of the war, according to estimates by Ukrainian Colonel Anatoly Stefan, and backed up by studies done by the US Center for Naval Analysis. These reports suggest an estimated 160 of those 1,500 lost officers were generals, major generals, and lieutenant generals, as well as more than 150 colonels and lieutenant colonels, 250 majors, 296 captains, and nearly 500 senior lieutenants, in descending order of rank. While confirmed numbers, as with the lost Russian hardware, suggest a much lower number is more likely, it's clear that whatever the actual total is, Russia is losing far more officers of higher ranks than most Western armies would under similar battlefield conditions. As noted previously, one of the few areas where Russian military has been successful is with its private military companies, like Wagner. But there have been highly publicized clashes between Prigozhin, Wagner's leader, and the Russian military leadership in Moscow. Prigozhin has complained on multiple occasions that his private military group's needs have not been met. Meanwhile, whenever a high-ranking officer from the regular Russian army was fired, Prigozhin has been hiring them and adding them to his own private army, further distancing himself from Moscow. Prigozhin's march on Moscow was responsible for another loss for Russia. General Sergei Sarovkin, the deputy commander of the Russian group of forces fighting in Ukraine, disappeared from public sight following the march and was rumored to be under arrest for knowing about Prigozhin's plan and not informing Putin. Sarovkin's disappearance will be keenly felt across the entirety of the Russian military, as he was one of the most reliable ground commanders in the army, having attained his rank through skill and accomplishments, unlike those above him in the Russian chain of command who owed their position due to loyalty to Putin above all else. We've seen the many problems Russia is having with its troop losses and its population decline. How well is Ukraine doing in filling out its army? Ukraine has exceeded all expectations in lasting more than a year against a country nearly 30 times its size in area, 17 million square kilometers versus 603,000 square kilometers, and more than triple its size in population, 143 million versus 43 million for Ukraine. That widely accepted estimate of the Ukrainian population of roughly 43 million is contradicted by other sources. According to statistics compiled by England's The Economist newspaper, Ukraine, including Crimea and the Donbass, has lost about 16% of its population between its independence in 1991 from the former Soviet Union and the eve of the 2022 Russian invasion. These numbers suggest that Ukraine now has a population of only about 36 million, compared to around 52 million in 1991. But that's to be expected in a country where the invader, Russia, has indiscriminately attacked civilian population centers and has leveled whole cities, like Mariupol which has seen its pre-war population of 400,000 reduced to less than 5,000. This same Russian effort to depopulate any area of resistance has been repeated across whole regions of Ukraine. According to the Joint Research Center of the European Economic Union the EU, Ukraine will continue to see a steady decline in its population over the next 20 to 30 years, even under the most optimistic of circumstances. The JRC has estimated that by the beginning of February 2023, Around 5.3 million Ukrainian civilians had been displaced internally across Ukraine, while approximately 7 million had emigrated to other countries, with around 4 million of those fleeing to nearby EU countries, especially Poland. This means that the invasion has displaced close to 30% of the entire Ukrainian population, both inside and outside of Ukraine. That accounts for the disparity between the pre-war estimates of 43 million for the Ukrainian population and the more recent 35 to 36 million figure. It would seem then that Ukraine could be facing a shortfall of the younger demographic that usually makes up military service recruits. However, those numbers belie the reality that an overwhelming number of volunteers have flooded the Ukrainian army, more than they can adequately train and supply. Since the beginning of the invasion in February 2022, Ukraine has seen a truly heroic response not just from within its own borders, but from abroad as well. An estimated 2,000 to 3,000 foreign fighters are believed to be serving in three battalions of a Ukrainian unit named the International Legion, according to analysts and academics monitoring them. But because the Ukrainian government wishes to keep such numbers private, these numbers are only best-guess estimates. 
In the early months of the war, Ukrainian officials estimated that as many as 20,000 volunteers from more than 50 countries had arrived to help fight against the Russian invasion. But according to analysts and interviews with many of the foreign fighters who stayed, the vast majority appear to have returned home before the summer. Hundreds of the better-trained volunteers have since then been integrated into smaller units that operate independently of the International Legion. These groups, led by longtime regional opponents of Moscow such as the Georgian Legion and Chechen battalions, as well as other primarily Western units with names like Alpha, Phalanx and the Norman Brigade. Some of the volunteers who stayed are being used to train young Ukrainian recruits, though their training is often rudimentary. Where a Western nation like the US would spend up to 10 weeks of training in boot camp, the Ukrainian recruits often get as little as 3 to 5 days, though most will get around 2 to 3 weeks. It's not just the total number of troops that Ukraine has that should be considered, but also the troops who are trained well enough to survive the most dangerous first few weeks of their deployment. It's also clear that the numbers of Ukrainian men and women who volunteered were more than the Ukrainian army could train early in the war. More than 140,000 Ukrainians, mostly men, have returned from Europe. According to a social media post by Ukrainian Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov from March 2022, tens of thousands joined the territorial defense forces. According to the Ukrainian Interior Ministry, between 9 and 12 new assault brigades, totaling 40,000 men, have been training for months to help spearhead the current counteroffensive. Their numbers were swelled by countrywide media campaigns that called on young Ukrainians, both men and women, to join up to help rid their country of the Russian invaders. One of the leaked assessment documents from February 2023 titled Russia-Ukraine Assessed Combat Sustainability and Attrition, compiled by the US Defense Intelligence Agency, suggested that Ukraine had suffered as many as 130,000 total casualties, including 17,000 killed in action and another 113,000 wounded. Ukraine has been very tight-lipped about their own casualty figures, so these numbers are merely best-guess estimates. Overall, it can be seen that Ukraine does have less population from which to draw its military recruits, while sustaining very large losses over the first year of the war. Offsetting this has been a continued strong volunteer effort from both inside and outside Ukraine. The violence that Russia has unleashed on the Ukrainian civilians has convinced many in Ukraine, who would normally let others do the fighting, to step up and join their country in defending against the Russian invaders. No matter how long this war goes on, whether for months or years, it doesn't appear that Ukraine will run out of highly motivated volunteers anytime soon. The original question, will Russia run out of troops before Ukraine does, seemed at first to be an easily answered question. With three times the population, it would have appeared that Russia would simply be able to wear down Ukraine over years of relentless grinding warfare. But the reality is, Russia's military is on the brink of collapse. Their best units have been shattered, and their ranks have been filled with ill-trained, poorly supplied, and poorly led conscripts. Their once vaunted dominance in tanks is now just a memory, and their artillery is being outfought and outshot by more accurate and longer range systems supplied by the West. Russia's air force can't gain air superiority over the battlefield, while Russia's economy is so drastically damaged that they simply cannot replace the losses they've suffered in high tech weapons. Ukraine appears motivated enough and well enough equipped that, if the war were to last another year or another 10, they'd never run out of people willing to fight to remove the last Russian occupier from their land. But what do you think? How close is Putin to completely running out of soldiers? Will Ukraine continue to be successful in replacing their short-term manpower deficit? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts.